Hello everyone, welcome to the next live webinar in our webinar series. You know, I gotta say there's just been such an incredible response to our uh, commissioning webinars that we've been doing here. There's been a overwhelming response, an overwhelming level of interest in uh, the topic of commissioning. This webinar alone, we had over 500 people register and the commissioning community is, is, is rather small. So to have this level of response is, is, is awesome. I, I love the comments we receive. I appreciate everyone's support and it's awesome that you're part of this commissioning community. So glad to have you here. Today's topic, we're going to talk about pre-commissioning of electrical systems. So if you're ready, and by ready, I mean uh, ready to start learning a structured commissioning process and go from late and over budget projects to defect free systems, then let's get going. So for those of you that don't know me, I'm Paul Turner. I'm the founder of the Commissioning Academy, a company focused on commissioning education. We're on a mission to help projects deliver on time and on budget with better commissioning processes because we know that good things happen when commissioning is properly planned and executed. Like Johnald, for example, after taking our programs, Johnald finally was able to understand the importance of each phase of commissioning. Or Hillary, who obtained a deeper understanding of all levels of commissioning. Or Reynold, who gained massive benefits in managing his commissioning projects from the checklists and forms that we provided him. And the reason people are getting these results? They're copying the exact steps that we're about to go through in this webinar. By the end of this presentation, you will know the step-by-step -step repeatable methods to take control of your electrical pre-commissioning and learn how to plan and execute like the pros. You're going to see the exact process, the exact steps to take, and how to complete electrical pre-commissioning on time and on budget. And just to give credit where credit is due, the results you will see in this webinar are from people who have been through our program called Commissioning Academy. But that's not what this webinar is about. In this webinar, we're pulling out the specific things you need to know to complete electrical pre-commissioning on time and on budget. We've helped hundreds of people take control of their commissioning careers, and in the process, we've seen the trends of the people that get the best results. So for today's webinar, we've distilled it into the key steps that we'll share with you on how to successfully plan and execute electrical pre-commissioning. So why am I here teaching this content today? The truth is, I have been commissioning complex systems for many years. I have seen project commissioning go well and project commissioning be a complete disaster. Project commissioning can be one of the best experiences in your career, or it can be a living hell, full of stress, frustration, and sleepless nights. But it doesn't have to be this way. If you follow industry-proven methods to plan and execute your electrical pre-commissioning. Project commissioning matters to me because of the profound impact it has had on my project success. And this is what I want for everyone, to be part of a winning project team. I believe everyone deserves to be part of successful projects. Life is stressful enough and project commissioning should not be one more thing that adds stress to your life. So I'm curious, if you could confidently plan and execute project commissioning, what would you do in your career? Go ahead, write it in the chat, let's see. So you're definitely gonna to wanna to stay to the end of this webinar. I've got some goodies that you can download at the end of this webinar for free, and I'll give you the link of how you can access those at the end of this webinar. And as we're going through the discussion, we have a live Q&A at the end. So if a question comes up, write it in the chat. We'll gather up those questions and we'll be able to answer them at the end of today's session. So 
So we're going to go through the steps for electrical pre-commissioning, but before we do that, there's some key off-site activities to take care of to ensure that our electrical pre-commissioning goes smoothly. One of those key activities is factory acceptance testing and particularly integrated factory acceptance testing. So this is the testing that's done off-site in the factory before equipment is shipped to site. And it's important to do proper factory acceptance tests so that we can identify any errors with the equipment or any issues that need to be rectified before equipment gets to site. Without a properly conducted FAT, then the, the issues that would have been discovered in the factory are deferred till later in the project and only discovered during on-site commissioning, which of course is going to uh, delay and cause issues with our on-site commissioning activities. Particularly when systems have software involved, we need to be doing an integration of the hardware and the software in the factory before equipment is shipped to site. It's too late in the project to only be integrating software with the systems on site uh, after equipment has been installed. At that point, any of the issues that should have been discovered earlier in the factory, all of that risk is transferred to later in the project, making our on-site commissioning so much more difficult. So we need to ensure that proper integration of the hardware and the software is completed in the factory before equipment. Now, testing in the factory isn't a replacement for testing on site. We need to be doing both because the test setups are somewhat differently. But anything that we can test in advance is going to mitigate risk to later in the project so that we don't have issues during on-site uh, pre-commissioning and commissioning. Another aspect to focus on is construction completion. So our construction counterparts are going to be installing, assembling the equipment, and there's certain aspects that they're going to be uh, testing in their ins inspection test plans prior to handover to commissioning. Certain things uh, like point-to-point -point checks to confirm that cables are pulled correctly and terminated correctly into each of the communication cubicles, as well as mega checks to make sure that any of the cables that are installed on site aren't damaged or are going to cause any issues during commissioning. So this process to confirm construction completion is called mechanical completion. The mechanical completion defines the system to be handed over, uh, the level of QC, QA to be completed on that equipment, and the date when that particular system or subsystem is required, hand over to the commissioning team so that we can proceed with our electrical pre-commissioning activities. In advance of on-site commissioning, from a commissioning team perspective, we're also getting all of our pre-commissioning documentation in place. So these would be all the checklists that we're going to use to verify the various components on the project. We're going to be going through the drawings, identifying the equipment to test and the level of testing to take place and putting together all the paperwork, uh, the checklists, so that we have those in hand. And once we mobilize to site to start pre-commissioning, we know exactly what we need to do and we can start executing per the checklists. Now there's uh, a, lot of, a lot of equipment to test, but we don't necessarily need to go and create all of these checklists from scratch. A lot of these devices have been tested in the past for many years, and the checks are, are very similar to what's been done for, for decades. So we need to be leveraging the online databases that exist that have a lot of these standard checklists. It's a great place to start, not to say that that checklist is exactly what needs to be checked on site, but it's a great place to start where maybe one point can be removed from the checklist or a few more points added to make it specific to the project but you can get uh, a really good head start by accessing these repositories of checklists online as a great starting point to help us create some of this documentation to at least use as a, a template, a starting point to create our pre-commissioning documentation. So one of the first terms you might hear on uh, during pre-commissioning on site is uh, site acceptance testing or uh, system acceptance testing. The SAT is really the complement from the factory acceptance testing. What would have been tested in the factory is then tested again on site and the results compared between the two of them. This is to confirm that since the equipment left the factory that there was no damage during shipping or no damage during installation, that we're getting the same results uh, from what was measured in the factory. For example, 
we may be doing a, a vibration test uh, on a, a pump or a motor, we want to confirm that the vibration levels are the same on site as was measured in the factory. Some of the other uh, maybe more complex electrical tests related to winding resistance or uh, transformer ratios, we want to make sure that equipment wasn't damaged or, or internal components dislodged that are giving us different results than we're receiving in the factory. And this would be our, our site acceptance testing. Often the vendor is involved in site acceptance testing to confirm that they've completed their scope of work for delivery of the equipment to site and it still meets contract requirements and matches what was measured in the factory. The vendor would be participating likely in our, our site acceptance testing because once these tests are passed, that would confirm that the vendor has completed and uh, sign off for payment of them. Uh, at that point, that piece of equipment can then be used for further integration into other systems on site. Electrical pre-commissioning is performed by the commissioning team. Some of the electrical testing that we're going to be doing involves more complex test setups and often requires specialized test equipment that only the commissioning team would have or even a, a specialized team that's brought in as a member of the commissioning team to perform our electrical pre-commissioning. So when we get into open circuit uh, tests or short circuit tests, these involve large uh, closures into into ground where uh, and uh, very specialized monitoring equipment to measure transients during a applied fault. This type of testing requires specialized equipment and a specialized skill set that the commissioning team can bring to the project to complete um, more specialized testing. So some of the first checks we'll do during electrical pre-commissioning are to confirm that equipment is grounded and bonded correctly to station ground. This is important to do early because as equipment is being energized for the first time, we can potentially encounter faults with the system. And if that occurs, we want to make sure that everything is grounded correctly, that any transients or faults can be uh, routed into the, the station ground system rather than through other equipment or through individuals involved. So all of the, the grounding of the equipment will be checked. Any bonds of any floating uh, metallic conductors will be verified around the station to confirm that all of the uh, fault paths to ground are in place prior to energizing any of the equipment. Next, we'll likely be applying first power to a lot of the equipment. So this isn't necessarily the main circuit power, but this would be auxiliary power to our communication cubicles, uh, communication racks, or control and protection systems. This is just to get the auxiliary power to the cubicle so it's energized and we can start testing it, communicating with other cubicles or to some of the instruments in the field prior to first startup of the main circuit power, prior to when we would energize, say, the 230 kV main bus system. First power uh, at, at this point during pre-commissioning would be to energize the auxiliary power systems to get our systems at least up and running and communicating so we can proceed with some more pre-commissioning tests. We'll be performing a lot of loop checks on our electrical systems. So you'll hear, hear the term cold loop checks or hot loop checks. Cold loop checks are done before first power. This would be more so your your point-to-point -point checks to make sure that all the cables are terminated correctly. Where we get into more uh, in-depth testing is during hot loop checks after first energization, where we can confirm that one cubicle is communicating with the next cubicle or that instruments are correctly interfaced to our PLC controllers. The loop check is essentially having the PLC to send the signal to the instrument ensure that it responds and that we're getting the right status signal back to the PLC, confirming that loop signal path um, between uh, our communication cubicles and our instruments in the field. This is also known as operational loop checks to confirm that we can control the status of a motor where we can turn it on, we can turn it off, and we're getting the correct status back to the PLC. So what our loop checks are doing is confirming the installation of the cubicle, the cable, as well as the instrument in the field. We can confirm that all devices are calibrated correctly, and we're confirming this back to our HMI system. Say, for example, if we've got a, a 4 to 20 milliamp device out in the field, 
We're, we're measuring that device. We're seeing that it's scaled correctly and being displayed properly on the HMI in the correct ranges and set points that are required for that particular instrument. When we're confirming our ranges and set points, we're also confirming the uh, alarm set points uh, for each instrument too. If we have a low, 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 high, high, high signal, those four points in the range, we're confirming that we're getting the right alarm triggers as we um, move the signal up and down within its range, confirming that we get the correct, correct alarm notifications within the HMI, and we're also confirming that we're getting the proper alarm routing into the alarm log so that operators can view the status of the equipment as it's triggering the various uh, alarm set points. You'll also see checks related to phase checks. In this example, in this picture, an open air switch yard, uh, we definitely want to confirm that ABC phase are connected correctly before energizing any of the bus work. In a large open air system such as this, it may be a visual inspection where we can confirm the risers are properly connected between the uh, overhead lines and the bus work. In smaller systems, we may be performing measurements to confirm electrically that systems are connected correctly. In very large systems, if we're going down, say, a many kilometer, many mile transmission line, we may need to drive the line and confirm that at various points of phase rotation, that by the end of the line, we're still getting the same phase out of the end of the line and it's, and it's corrected, connected to the proper bus work within the station. So this is something definitely to, to check. I've seen this caught last minute where uh, phases were incorrectly rolled and we want to avoid that situation because that can certainly cause uh, a lot of damage. Our large oil-filled transformers require pre-commissioning. Some of the checks we'll do are to take an oil sample before energization as well as after energization. Comparing those two oil samples will give us an idea if there's anything that's not functioning correctly within the transformer. If there's any hot spots or any off-gassing, we're going to see that in our second oil sample comparing to the first. Any contaminants in that oil could be an indication that there's something wrong inside that transformer that requires further investigation. So in the factory, we would have, mo we would have verified the, the winding resistance and the transformer ratios, but once our uh, uh, transformer arrives on site, we're going to want to uh, measure those again to confirm that nothing was dislodged during transport, that we're getting the same winding resistance, and that the transformer ratios are still as they were in the factory. Any incorrect readings there could indicate that maybe something has moved inside the transformer and requires an internal inspection to confirm if there's been any damage during shipping or installation. It's always a fun day when we do open circuit tests and short circuit tests. These are elaborate test setups to apply a, a pretty significant short to the transformer. These tests allow us to measure the no load losses and the full load losses. These are quite specialized tests and require a, a specialized test setup for sure. And uh, it's not something you definitely want to try and start out on your own. You want to join an experienced team, an experienced group that's done this before to, to see it in real time and learn exactly how to execute these complex and more dangerous tests. For monitoring faults within our, our switchyard or on our transformers or other AC apparatus, we're going to be performing protection relay testing. So the first thing we're going to want to do is get the uh, protection relay settings from our engineering team. They would have determined the coordinated protection settings for all the equipment, apparatus, and uh, control and protection devices, breaker systems throughout the electrical system. And all these coordinated settings need to be applied to the various equipment so that equipment is tripping off at the right levels based on other equipment within the system. So we'll apply those settings and then to confirm that the settings are applied correctly, we'll be performing PT and CT current injections both, both on the primary side and on the secondary side so that we can see that the various voltage and current levels are being read by the relay correctly and that the right settings are in there to trip at the appropriate levels. This is confirmed right back to the HMI where we're monitoring or measuring the, the PTCT injections and that they're coming through on the HMI correctly. 
as well as we mentioned before the uh, ranges and set points are correct at the various uh, alarm trigger points um, basically confirming that we can communicate with the relay and are getting the right status back to the HMI. Interlocks are an important aspect to verify during pre-commissioning. Interlocks provide a critical safety uh, protection mechanism on some of our electrical equipment as well as prevent damage from occurring to electrical equipment. So as an example, maybe we've got two switchgear lineups and they've got a tiebreaker in between those two switchgear. That tiebreaker can only be closed if one of the main utility feeds is disconnected. If both utility feeds are connected one to each switchgear, then that tiebreaker cannot be closed. So interlocks are established to prevent that from happening. If both incoming utility feeds are closed, that tiebreaker cannot be closed. And we want to verify these configurations and that the interlocks are functioning correctly before applying main circuit power to the switchgear lineup. We definitely want to check these uh, interlocks in advance because if, if they're not correct, then potentially we can, we can be creating a, a very hazardous situation that's not safe at all to work around and as well potentially damaging the equipment, which we don't want to do. So there will be a whole series of interlocks to be verified on, on some of your systems, and we want to go through every single one of them and make sure that they're functioning correctly in the field before applying main circuit power. Motor tests are, are commonly uh, tested during pre-commissioning, so once we get right down to the motor, we want to confirm that the AC phase is correct. We don't want to be having our motor spin backwards or potentially cause damage to the motor. So uh, at the motors, that this is often confirmed uh, through measurement, but could be visual as well for very large situations. We want to be measuring the, the winding resistance. This is confirming that whatever was measured in the factory is still the same uh, on site. We'll also want to be doing a, a motor bump test. So this is to confirm that power is connected correctly to the motor. We'll uh, just for a very brief moment of time apply power to the motor and confirm that it's spinning in the right direction. That's just an initial indication that uh, power feeds are correct and that when we turn on power and leave it on, it's not going to cause any damage. First, we'll run the motor under no load. So this is uncoupling. Say this motor is running a pump. If we uncouple it from the pump, we'll do a no load run maybe for a period of time and measure the performance of the motor, measure the voltage, measure the current under no load. If everything looks good there, then we would proceed to a coupled run. And this is with the motor actually connected to the pump under load we can perform the same measurements we can measure voltage currents if the pump is uh, running uh, say water through a pipe then we're measuring flow and pressure of the pump as well and we're measuring that at at least three points on the pump curve to confirm the pump and motor performance over the in entire load range um, that the pump is designed for High pot testing is often another test that's done on site. So this picture is of an existing system, but maybe those uh, standoff insulators are quite old and we want to test them to confirm that the dielectrics are still behaving as they need to. So we would disconnect that standoff from the, the circuit. We would probably clean it because it looks quite dirty. Um, so then the high pot test applies a large voltage across that particular electrical standoff and it's measuring the leakage current that takes place between those two high potentials. We want the leakage current to be zero or very low. If the leakage current is higher than a set threshold, then that means that the dielectric properties aren't behaving as they need to. We either need to adjust, clean, or retrofit that insulator in some manner or potentially replace it. This is done on new installations as well to confirm that there was no damage during shipping or installation and that our dielectrics are still meeting the uh, technical properties that they need to. A lot of our electrical systems will have a DC battery backup. So this is a picture of a large DC battery room with uh, a large amount of, of battery cells all connected there. Our battery cells would be connected to uh, an AC charger and a DC distribution system. 
Our battery room also has some exhaust fans in the background there for uh, any gases that our cells are generating, so it's exhausted from the room. So we're going to want to do pre-commissioning on this system to confirm that we've got our battery backup power as we need prior to using this for other areas of testing in the plant. So once the system is all complete, we'd be doing cycle testing on the battery where we uh, fully charge and fully discharge the batteries through multiple cycles to confirm that our AC charger is a correct, correctly interfaced with the batteries and that the battery cells are behaving correctly. We would do load testing to confirm the, the capacity of the batteries where we maybe apply a load and allow that load to discharge over a period of time to con confirm that we're getting the capacity out of our battery system that we're expecting. We'd also be doing some trip testing where we trip off the, the AC power and confirm that the, uh, AC, uh, that the DC distribution system picks up and continues to energize our equipment. Some of the other electrical systems you might come across uh, are more so balance of plant systems. So this would be some of your building systems, your life safety systems, such as HVAC or uh, emergency lighting. Maybe you've got a, a public address system, fire detection system. These are more so the, the building system to support the, the building and the shell of the building, more so to get the occupancy permit to be able to use the building further for other commissioning activities. Often these are vendor package systems where you've got a, a vendor that comes in and does the design, the installation, as well as the commissioning of your HVAC system. Or same thing for emergency lighting. They'll do the design, installation, and commissioning of the emergency lighting system. So from a commissioning perspective, we definitely want to ensure that the vendors are performing their commissioning activities correctly, that they're testing fully, that there's no gaps in, in what's being tested so that when it's signed off at the end and handed over to, co to commissioning, we're confident that we've got a good building system, uh, all the life safety systems are correct, and that we can then use it and integrate it to the more complex process commissioning of what's in the building and the actual intended purpose of the plant system. Of course, going through any of our pre-commissioning activities here, we can always encounter deficiencies. Uh, the goal is always to have zero deficiencies, but I've never seen that actually happen. So it's quite common to find deficiencies as we go through the process. And when we do, there's a process to categorize and track those deficiencies. So anything that's encountered as an issue that doesn't meet contract requirements is either a type A, a type B, or a type C deficiency. A type A deficiency is something that needs to be addressed right away. It presents a functional issue or a safety issue that must be addressed before any further commissioning can proceed. A type A deficiency is essentially that something that's going to stop our commissioning activities and needs to be fixed right away. A type B deficiency is something that needs to be addressed but doesn't necessarily impact what is taking place for commissioning right away. So this could be something that's more of a uh, a bit of a change but not necessarily needs to be done right now. A type B deficiency allows commissioning still to proceed but a type B deficiency must be complete prior to handover to the owner. And then a type C deficiency is something that's minor in nature. This could be a, a paint scratch or a hole in the drywall or something cosmetic. It really has no bearing or function uh, impact on the function of our systems. It does need to be addressed, but could be addressed at a later date, even after handover to the owner during the warranty period when our, our type C deficiencies can be rectified. So th through this process of categor categorizing each deficiency as they're identified, then we, we want to go through a process of tracking these to make sure that they're close, that they're closed. Um, the old way of tracking those would have been to create an Excel spreadsheet and try and track these manually. I've never seen that go well. It's a nightmare, especially when you're getting projects that have a significant amount of snags, a significant amount of deficiencies. So please don't use a, a spreadsheet or paper to try and track these deficiencies. There's much more sophisticated and superior uh, software packages that can help us manage, manage these and ensure that nothing gets missed during pre-commissioning. There's, there's tons of little things that, that can get identified here. And while an item may seem small and have no impact, all the little details matter during pre-commissioning and commissioning. 
So we want to make sure that they're tracked and closed correctly so they don't become much bigger issues later in the process. So at the end of pre-commissioning of a particular subsystem, then the commissioning team is confirming that all checklists are filled out and that all results are passing within tolerance. This will be one of the, the closeout activities to confirm that pre-commissioning is complete and that all systems are contract compliant before we move into the next phase of commissioning. And this is going to, of course, be a staggered process where we're going to complete pre-commissioning for one system and move into commissioning and maybe other systems are still undergoing construction or pre-commissioning, but for this particular subsystem, we've determined that pre-commissioning is complete and it can then be used for further integration into larger systems for more commissioning. So I've got an amazing event that you're definitely gonna wanna check out. This is a free three-day workshop that we're gonna be hosting soon called Commissioning Domination Live. So if you're watching this live, not next week, but the week after, we've got a free three-day workshop on February 22nd, 23rd, and 24th, one hour each day, where we're going to go through what exactly takes place during each stage of commissioning. So not just the pre-commissioning, electrical pre-commissioning steps that we went through here, the entire commissioning process from project concept to handover to the owner. We're going to go through what takes place during each step of commissioning. The workshop is free to join and you should definitely check it out because it expands even further on what we've gone through here today. And you can sign up for this free workshop at commissioningworkshop.com. If you access your certificate, I'll send you that link as well. So you can, when you get your certificate, you can join our, our live workshop. So please do. And I hope to see you there. So like I mentioned at the beginning of the workshop uh, webinar here, uh, we've got the certificate of participation for this webinar that you can get access to, as well as a copy of these slides. And if you go to courses.commissioningandstartup.com slash electrical, you can get access to both of those items there. So definitely check that out. Enter your uh, a few little questions there and your name and email address, and we'll get that emailed to you right away. That's courses.commissioningandstartup.com slash electrical. All right, so we're going to get into our live Q&A. I hope there's lots of good questions. We'll spend some time here and uh, answer as many questions as we can. So again, I've got the link up here for how you can access the certificate and copy of the slides. So definitely check that out. So first question I've got here, construction is the same as electrical installation, correct? Yes, that's correct. Construction and installation would both be similarly used terms. Um, so our construction team is definitely going to be installing a lot of the equipment. Their focus is at installation at an equipment level, which is great, which is what we need. As we transition from construction installation towards pre-commissioning, the thought process changes a little bit where the focus isn't so much on equipment, the focus is on system or subsystem. One piece of equipment isn't all that useful to us for commissioning. We need a whole group of equipment to form a subsystem or system. So I'll just point that out, that the thought process changes a little bit from construction to commissioning in that we need to be having a systems-based thought process in completing our systems so that we can build up the system and get it ready for the owner. Good question. So next question. So it means without handover or mechanical completion from grounding, there will be no pre-commissioning. So there are some activities that uh, the construction team will complete from a pre-commissioning standpoint, s particularly some of the uh, mechanical systems. So something like pipe flushing or uh, pressure testing, leak testing, because those are done during different stages of installation before the piping is actually complete, some of those pre-commissioning activities are actually identified in a construction ITP for those groups to complete. Mechanical completion then defines the point where the construction team is complete their scope of work 
and the pre-commissioning team and commissioning team can move on and start testing some of the systems. So you're right. If there is no mechanical completion, then that means the construction team isn't complete their scope of work and the system can't be ho handed over to commissioning. So mechanical completion and the definition of that milestone, exactly what it is, is critically important so that everybody knows exactly what they need to do, when they need to do it, and what that handover from one group to the other signifies. So next question is, yes, sometimes we have to make a deal with construction to give a system priority over construction packs. Just a comment from one of our electrical students, for sure, yep. That can definitely be the case. And um, when we say make a deal, um, we want to avoid kind of that sort of deal making because that's one of the biggest reasons to have the commissioning team involved much earlier in the project is we've outlined the priority well ahead of when those handovers are to take place. So a year or maybe two or well in advance of when those handovers are going to take place, we're going to identify what are those construction priorities. What does the construction team need to hand over first? What do they need to hand over second? What is that sequence for handover from the construction team to the commissioning team? So when I hear the term uh, deal, that seems like maybe a last minute sort of arrangement. And we want to avoid that where it's well known well in advance what the priorities are so that there's no surprises and we don't need to be making those kind of deals. Now, certainly there's, there's things that are going to happen on site. There's uh, procurement delays, unknown issues that are encountered, and things might change. So that could be where you need to talk to your construction team and make a deal um, to uh, work around some of those issues that are encountered. Um, so definitely, it is critically important that the construction team and the commissioning team are communicating very closely and working very well together. We don't want to see any competing priorities. We, w we don't want to see any big egos. We want um, very clean and collaborative uh, communication between the two groups so that we can navigate these issues as they arise and do what's uh, in the best interest of the project. Next question, kindly give some overview of feed and P&IDs as well as a bill of materials. So feed stands for front end engineering design and it's the, f the first or one of the early stages of the projects where the design team is taking the, the project concept and developing that further into actual uh, design drawings, manufacturing drawings, uh, a drawing set, a drawing package, and design details that can be used for later phases of the project to actually manufacture and install the equipment and eventually start testing the equipment. During the feed process is when the commissioning team wants to get involved to help the engineering team understand some of the priorities that are required and the sequence of the engineering deliverables, the order that needs to be created to align eventually with the end startup sequence of the project. So it's uh, it can be sometimes a, a very lengthy, lengthy phase of the project to complete that front end engineering, but critical to have that early stage of the project aligned with the startup sequence at the end of the project so that the right deliverables from engineering are being presented to construction and then construction is presenting the right deliverables to commissioning in the right order that lines up with sequence. So a P&ID is a piping and instrumentation drawing. It's essentially a, a mechanical drawing that shows the mechanical piping layout, where some of the instruments are installed within the piping, um, how the piping is interconnected to valves and uh, pumps, and uh, basically the, the process flow of your particular plant process. It's a very useful drawing. It would be, a, I guess, a, a counterpart to a single level, single line drawing in our, in the case of our electrical world. The P&ID gives the mechanical layout of the plant and how everything's interconnected. You'll hear of the term uh, a P&ID walkthrough. That's the process of taking that P&ID drawing out in the field, visually confirming that everything's installed correctly. It can be as simple as just highlighting on the drawing. There's, there's more sophisticated ways to do it too. And confirming that every instrument is in place, all piping's in place, uh, everything's interconnected for uh, pumps and valves. 
and essentially installation is complete from a from a mechanical standpoint prior to moving into testing of those systems bill of materials would then be just the list of uh, pieces of either equipment or material that is used to make up that particular system be it an electrical system or a mechanical system you would have your listed materials of this type of gauge of wire this communication cub cubicle this valve this pump listing out the specific part number description and quantity of that item essentially it's your shopping list to say this is what you need to go buy in order to build this system so i hope that answers your question so another question what is not clear to me is the electrical system boundary its hierarchy and priority so this is a very good question um, because boundary isolations are critically important from a commissioning safety perspective and from a lockout tagout perspective so we can have electrical systems that are interconnected in many many ways through communication uh, cables power cables high voltage cables low voltage cables dc cables ac cables and there could there's certainly many boundaries that could separate one system from the other so when we're when the system is all complete all those boundaries are removed and it's one system but during this critical overlap of construction and commissioning there's certainly situations where construction is still taking place in one area of the plant while commissioning is proceeding in another and those boundary isolations are critically important to ensure that those boundary isolations are maintained and that nothing's being energized into an area where another group is working. So the process of identifying those boundary isolations is through the lockout tagout process where um, you're, wanna get, you're gonna wanna get access to the most accurate current up-to-date set of IFC drawings, which is the red line drawings. The red line drawings are going to indicate anything that was pen potentially changed in the field if there was a design change or um, a field wiring change if there was a, a rolled wire or something that needed to be changed. We get access to those most current red line drawings so that we have the most current information and then review of that drawing uh, from a very technical perspective we're going to identify what are the isolations that need to take place in order that we maintain that boundary across all of those signals, all of those voltage levels from one area of the plant to the other. That's identified and passed to our uh, lockout authority and our, our lotto uh, managing group. They're gonna review and confirm that particular lotto request with others going, other activities going on in the plant. It may be uh, during construction or during more later phases of commissioning to evaluate if there's any other simultaneous operations that are taking place that need to be evaluated and the lotto authority will determine yes this particular lockout tagout can be granted for this period of time to maintain that boundary isolation then once that's determined any particular locks that need to be applied to the equipment to lock those out and then a tag identifying who owns that lock is applied to that piece of equipment that could be locking out a breaker that could be locking out a valve anything to maintain or ensure that any hazardous energy is maintained at that boundary isolation. So when you talk about hierarchy and priority, that's the, the role of the lotto authority to manage all the various lockout tagout requests and ensure that the proper hierarchy is maintained and any priority is given. So it could be the case where a particular lotto request can't be granted at that time because there's other equipment that's locked out and it is higher priority so then that particular lotto request may not be able to take place this week it might have to be pushed till next week or however that can be fit into the situation so this is definitely a very important topic particularly during pre-commissioning as construction is still being completed and needs to be a strong focus of everyone involved in the project to ensure that our boundary isolations are maintained So next question, the main problem is when the project manager does not understand he needs us, commissioning team, and early stage. You're absolutely right. We hear this all the time is that um, 
projects aren't bringing in commissioning early enough. They view it as an extra expense, right? Why do we want an additional person on site? Commissioning isn't until two years from now. Um, why do we want to pay for another two or three or four people this early in the project? What are they going to do? And you're right. That's just a, a complete lack of understanding of of commissioning and, and how it works because if the commissioning team is only mobilizing to site when it's time to start commissioning, well, it's too late by then. All the commissioning team can do is identify issues rather than two years ago pro proactively identify issues, work with the teams, and ensure that commissioning goes smoother later. Um, by doing that, unfortunately, your, your project manager is um, costing the project lots of money. By not having the commissioning team involved earlier, then that's not setting the commissioning team up for success. On really complex projects, it can sometimes take a year or more to plan out the sequence of commissioning and ensure that it's going to go smoothly. Um, we definitely want the commissioning team involved earlier, and it's a constant challenge to raise awareness and show the value of commissioning. And really, that's one of the reasons that we're here today, why I've been giving this live webinar, is to raise the awareness and help people understand the value of commissioning so that we can get into projects a bit earlier, help save money on projects, and help them deliver on time. So I'll keep sharing that message. You keep sharing that message. The, the more awareness we can get, the more uh, we can help our projects to succeed. Next question. Has anyone been using Dynamics 365 as a CMS completion system? So that's not one that I've particularly used in the past. Um, there's several that exist on the market, some that uh, have recently been um, developed, say, in the last few years that are fantastic, that are built on revolutionary technology like big data technology and really leverage the, the systems that exist today. There's some that are more maybe uh, created um, 10 years ago, 20 years ago, that are more so uh, legacy systems. But... Um, you, you really need to evaluate the needs of your project and the size of the system that you need. Some of the systems that exist today are amazing. I'm just uh, surprised by the amount of uh, features and how they can leverage the data that's available on the projects to help us manage our projects. I actually, this was the topic of our, our previous webinar on commissioning software. So I encourage you to go back and check uh, from uh, our January webinar where we went through that in a lot more detail. And you can check on uh, commissioningandstartup.com. I've got a good article on commissioning software as well as a list of the current uh, software vendors that are out there. I don't have Dynamics 365 listed, but that's probably a good one to add to the list. Next question. Being an INC operation and maintenance engineer, how can I learn and switch my career to INC and electrical commissioning engineer? So operations is a, a much needed skill set in the commissioning team. We can sometimes see uh, engineers that are per participating in commissioning and maybe they're really smart engineers, but they lack that operational on-site hands-on experience. So I definitely encourage you to make that transition because having that operational background, that operational experience is a is a key skill set to have as part of our commissioning teams. It's it's an understanding of the owner's needs and requirements and an understanding of how the plant is going to be operated for decades to come after it goes in service. So I definitely encourage you to take that operation knowledge that you have and apply that to commissioning. So how do you do that? A great way to do that is to, to start learning, to understanding the commissioning processes. And we've got lots of great resources at commissioningandstartup.com from free resources to paid resources that you can check out and see what's a best fit for you. Getting that fundamental understanding of how the commissioning process works and what are the steps in it is critical. Um, before you actually get to site and doing the commissioning, that knowledge baseline is critical to have. I see some people get to site where they're new to commissioning, they don't understand the commissioning process, but they're trying to execute commissioning on site. And it's a bit of a struggle without having that underlying background and knowledge of what the commissioning process is. So I really suggest that to be your starting point is check out some of our resources and how we can get you started and help you point it in the right direction. 
Um, once you get that baseline knowledge, then uh, that'll help you join another project where you can continue to learn on site, get your hands on experience and continue your learning process. One thing I'll say is commissioning is really a commitment to lifelong learning. There's no um, ability to learn everything in a six month period and then you're set for life. Commissioning is always learning daily, continuing to get more knowledge about the systems, getting more knowledge about the process and keeping up to date on our skill sets as projects continue to get more and more complex. <coughs> Next question, can type B and C punches be a showstopper? I would typically say no, because if it's a type B or a type C and you're indicating it as a showstopper, then in all likelihood, that should be a type A deficiency. A type A deficiency would be something that the pump is just physically not installed. Well, there's nothing we can do about that. <laughs> the pump needs to be installed. That's a type A deficiency. Installation is not complete. so. Um, we want to identify that as a type A. If something's a type B, but it's still holding you up from commissioning, then you should probably look at reclassifying it to a type A deficiency. This is always a debate. Everybody, I sit through too many meetings where we just want to debate, is this a type A, is this a type B deficiency? And it's always a debate. You want to set up some sort of uh, determination process. You'll see in a lot of contracts where the engineer has final determination. So that role, that contract role of the engineer, when those disputes arise inevitably of, is this a type A, is this a type B, that's taken to the engineer. The engineer will make that final determination and say, no, this type B really should be a type A, guys. It's reclassified, go get it done. Next question, during the motor solo run, who should be in charge, electrical commissioning team or mechanical commissioning team? Hmm. Good question. Uh, can be either. I would probably say that there's a, a skill set of each involved uh, in that particular run. Getting the, the motor up and running uh, is probably an electrical commissioning team member function, given that it's the first uh, uh, point in time where we're interfacing power to the motor, getting it uh, energized, operating in the right direction. Um, so that would be an electrical team function. Once the motor's running and driving a pump, then probably some of the mechanical team is involved because they're going to want to confirm pressure rates, flow rates from the pump, uh, measure the three points on the pump curve, and determine that the, the pump is running correctly. So there's, there's aspects of both involved. I wouldn't necessarily who's leading it um, uh, one versus the other because it's a team effort. We want the right skill sets involved from uh, both mechanical and electrical perspective when we're starting up those systems that involve both disciplines and we'll definitely want to get the right people involved for other systems that don't have any mechanical component then it may strictly be your two or three electrical team members that you've got looking after those activities same for mechanical if if it's a mechanical startup activity then your mechanical guys are going to get involved while the electrical guys are working on something else so it's always equipment specific and um, the commissioning manager's role from a day-to-day -day perspective to make sure that the right people are involved, the right people are seeing our system start up, and that we're getting the right results um, from our systems. Next question, what about the PTW? Work permit prior to an electrical commissioning activities? Good question. Yeah, the permit to work is a critical part of our lockout tagout process. So, what I described earlier when we're applying to our lockout tagout authority to um, request a certain outage or shutdown and get our equipment locked out. When the lockout tagout authority reviews that and basically gives permission to uh, have that outage at that particular time, what they're issuing is a permit to work. So say uh, the construction team needs to be working on a particular set of equipment uh, next week starting Monday till Friday and they need it locked out. They've made that application in advance of the equipment that they need locked out, that the, the motor or the, the power feed that they need locked out. The lockout tag authority is going to review that and say, yep, no problem. Next week starting Monday at 8 a.m., you can uh, we can have that equipment cleared and here's your permit to work to do that work. The permit to work will identify the dates of when the outage starts, when the outage ends, the uh, permit to work will also identify the key holder responsible to uh, maintain that lockout, the individual actually doing the work on the equipment. 
at the end of that outage, then the PTW is surrendered back to the lockout tagout authority, essentially saying that the work is complete, they've removed their locks from the system, and that the equipment can be re-energized. So the permit to work is definitely an important part of our lockout tagout process are bound to maintain our boundary isolations for these critical shutdowns or outages. Next question, is continuity check the same as a point-to-point -point check? Yes, it is. Um, we're checking you know, for systems that are, are closer to each other. When we're doing a point-to-point -point check and we're checking cubicle one is connected to cubicle two, and that cable is properly terminated to terminal block three, uh, point two to the other cubicles, terminal block four, point six. We're measuring the, the resistance between those two po points on the terminal block to confirm that uh, that particular conductor is connected correctly between those two points. So point to point check is also verifying the continuity between those two points where we can measure that uh, the conductor is connected correctly between those two points. Next question. These are all real good questions. Keep them coming. Why the pre-commissioning team is part of the commissioning team, I always know them as two separate teams. Yes, and that can definitely be the case where you've got, and it, it often is the case, where you've got a dedicated pre-commissioning team and a dedicated commissioning team. Because these activities are going to be overlapped, the pre-commissioning pre team is going to be working on a specific subsystem, and once they're complete, then they're going to move on to the next uh, subsystem to complete. So their specialization is pre-commissioning. They're going to focus on going from one system to the next to the next and doing their pre-commissioning. Then the commissioning team is maybe a different set of people that's coming in behind them and performing commissioning or integrating those systems with other areas of the plant. So it can, it can definitely be uh, uh, a definite a separate team structure in how you want to set that up. That's not always the case. Sometimes on smaller projects, it's the same group that oversees one system from start to finish, from beginning of testing to end of testing. It depends on how, how large the project is, how you want to structure the project. It uh, depends on the skill sets that are involved, um, the skill sets of the team, and how best to use those. So the commissioning manager is definitely going to review that to determine who they've got on the team, what skill sets they need, and who should be going through the various sequences of testing. And uh, often it may be separate pre-commissioning team from commissioning team, so that's a very good point. Can hazardous inspection hold pre-commissioning or commissioning process if the inspection has not been accepted yet? Absolutely, yep. Because as we go through pre-commissioning and commissioning, we'll get to start up placing these systems in service. If that particular hazardous inspection needs to be done before the equipment is energized, then it must be done. Um, that can be sometimes the reason to identify something as a type A deficiency. If it's going to require a significant outage to rectify or address at a later point in time, we may not get that outage for a few years during next routine maintenance. So it must be done now before systems are placed into service. So if an outstanding inspection is classified as a type A deficiency because it's going to have a significant shutdown or outage required, then as a type A deficiency, that must be done before we can proceed with any further pre-commissioning or commissioning activities. Next question. How do you define the commissioning skyline steps? Timeline plan? activity in any particular process. Can you explain in general? So I'm not familiar with the term skyline, but a timeline plan definitely is. Um, and this is something we go into great detail. We had a great discussion about this on Monday during our Commissioning Academy discussion. The short answer is essentially the commissioning team is going to determine the startup sequence for the plant. There really is only one path that you can go through to start up a lot of the equipment. When we go through the high-level sequence, we're going to know that we need AC power before we energize HVAC. We know that we need the, the 230 kV switchyard energized and operational before we can energize the 230 kV synchronous condenser. We know that the AC must be uh, fully commissioned and ready before we can energize the HVDC components of the system. So at a very high level, 
there's only one way to go through the sequence. It can't be that you're going to energize the HVDC stuff, but the AC switch yard isn't going to be available for a, a year later. It just doesn't work. You need your power uh, in in feed and out feed into your AC switch yards before you can do the HVDC. So from a technical standpoint, it's going to dictate that you need this system before the next. The commissioning team is going to help put that together. At that very high level, then when you break down into the details, you're going to see that the one particular AC control building within that AC switchyard is required before uh, you energize AC bay number two or whatever that technical dependency is to build up the system. The commissioning team is going to define this and that's going to help some of the earlier groups, the construction team and the design team, understand how the systems are going to be energized and started up and therefore which ones need to be built in what priority and which ones need to be designed in what priority. So um, from a timeline plan, that's how it's all going to fit together. Once you get further down into the details on a particular uh, system in that overall high level sequence, you're going to see that um, you need to have mechanical completion complete on this particular piece of equipment. Then you're going to go through the pre-commissioning activities as you define them in your checklists. And then you're going to go through uh, commissioning or integration with other systems in your system. And it's all a technical dependency of what portion of the project is required and needed to move on to the next stage of commissioning. And the commissioning team is the only group that can define that because it's entirely dependent on how the commissioning team wants to start up and energize the new systems. Um, nobody else can define that. The construction team can't say, well, no, no, you're going to energize it in this order. Well, it doesn't work like that. It has to be energized in a cer certain sequence because of the technical dependencies of what the next system requires. So I hope that answers your question. What is the sequence of managing red line markup drawings? Often uh, I see this done in a, a manual process where you might set out a, a master set of printed e-size drawings and uh, there's one group that maintains that hard copy set of drawings. So through construction that would be an individual within the construction team that's marking those up in red ink or green ink for anything that's changed on that drawing. That's how it's been done for years. Now there's better ways to do that where it's electronically because when you have a printed hard copy set of drawings then that's in one of the construction tailors, trailers that everybody's got to go see and it's a bit of a uh, old legacy process. I still see it exist because it works but a lot of the digital systems that exist now allow us to track that online where there's still one master set of drawings, but at least everybody can log into the system and see those drawings and not have to run around site trying to find that one magical hard copy set of drawing that sometimes goes missing too. <clears throat> so that process of managing during construction uh, to mark up those red lines, that's one of the key deliverables at mechanical completion is to hand those red line drawings over to the commissioning team because then the commissioning team becomes the owner of those drawings to continue keeping them accurate for any issues that are discovered during commissioning, any changes that are made, and <clears throat> mark up any additional changes to those drawings so that at the end of commissioning when the drawings are, or the systems are put into service, we have that accurate set of red line drawings. We can leave a copy with the operations team while those red line markups are sent to uh, the originator of that drawing to incorporate those red lines into a CAD version of drawings, which then becomes the as-built set of drawings that the operating team uses for the life of the plant. Having that most current as-left configuration in the drawings, in the as-builts, then operations can work with that for years to come. <coughs> so lots of good questions. We got, uh, we got more time. We'll keep going through some more here. <clears throat> Any special consideration in regards to some potentially destructive testing sometimes required for power cables, transformers, generators, and motors during pre-commissioning? Some potentially destructive testing. That can always be the case, yeah. I'm thinking of when we were talking about open circuit uh, or short circuit test where we're applying a large short to a large rotating machine. 
there's always hazards that could exist where if the protection systems don't operate as they're supposed to, applying that large short could potentially cause damage. So before we get to that point, we're definitely going to want to verify um, during our pre-commissioning that all of our CTs, PTs, protection relays, everything's set up correctly so that we have the highest degree of confidence that our protection systems are going to work correctly when we actually apply that full short to the system. Um, that's going to mitigate the risk that if when that short is applied, um, our systems don't react correctly and we can cause damage to the systems. So anything that we can check at a lower level to confirm that all of our protection systems are in place, we definitely want to confirm. Another potentially destructive test I can think of is we've done uh, uh, line HVDC line fault testing in the past where you apply a fault to uh, a DC line and you're basically creating your own lightning. If the uh, protection systems at either end of the transmi transmission line don't react correctly, then we can potentially damage the HVDC converter systems, and we don't want to do that. So prior to applying that DC fault to the line, we've verified anything and everything that we possibly can at the station level to confirm that all of our protection systems are going to operate correctly. So to mitigate that risk of potentially destructive testing, we want to basically build the system up in as many small steps as we can, verifying every little step along the way so that we have the highest degree of confidence that when we apply the potentially destructive fault to the system, the systems are going to react appropriately and not cause any damage. <coughs> Next question, do you find commissioning is similar from OGC to tech and semiconductor sectors? Good question. I don't know if I've thought about that before. Um, let's think about that for a second. I can definitely see similarity in getting some of these large facilities set up and running, like a large semiconductor plant is definitely going to have uh, significant elements of pre-commissioning and commissioning to get that plant up and running. Um, the actual semiconductor plant that's operations, I would consider that more similar to operations of, of a plant process, so kind of post-commissioning activity. Uh, there's certainly similar skill sets involved in both, and there can be comparisons that are drawn between them. Um, so if you're if you're looking and comparing those two industries and considering uh, transitioning for one from one to the other, I can definitely see that there's correlation in those skill sets that are involved and potentially um, things that are learned from one can be applied to the other and vice versa. <coughs> Next question: Short circuit and arc flash analysis study are these part of commissioning activities or requirements for the power? systems energization. <clears throat> so I often see that um, analysis or design of the systems, such as performing uh, an arc flash study, that would be something that your engineering team performs. Um, the engineers being the, the group that designed the systems, planned and uh, set all of the protection coordination settings between switchgear breakers and uh, transformers, CTs, PTs, relays, protection settings, based on their study of all those protected coordinating uh, studies and settings, they're also then going to do an arc flash study based on those protected uh, or coordinated settings. Um, through an arc flash analysis, you're basically going to determine the incident energy that is available within each cubicle or uh, um, particular piece of equipment, say if a breaker needs to be racked in or racked out or a cubicle door needs to be open to access equipment in there, there's a particular set of incident energy that's uh, available in that cubicle determined by the voltage levels that are available, the current that is available, as well as how fast a lot of the coordinated protection settings are going to react to that particular fault. So the engineering team um, I've seen in every case has done that particular study to determine the arc flash hazards that exist within that particular cubicle. 
based on that, then um, a label is applied to the outside of the, the cubicle. Uh, often before even any of this, well, in certainly in any case, before any of this stuff is energized, those hazards are identified on the outside of cubicles so that from a commissioning team perspective, when we're working with these systems during pre-commissioning or commissioning, if we need to access equipment, troubleshoot, um, breaker issues, we need to rack out a breaker, rack in a breaker. We need to know um, the incident energy that's involved and how to do those activities safely. So that would be something that's determined by the engineering team. Same thing with a, a short circuit test or an open circuit test. The engineering team would have designed the particular equipment to accommodate or react or uh, behave dynamically to these certain types of events. They'll be the ones that have defined that. They'll be the ones that will study the results of it. The commissioning team will, will execute the test and probably give those results back to the engineering team to review and analyze and confirm that the transients involved in that particular test are within their design tolerance and behaving appropriately. <coughs> so during these types of tests, certainly the commissioning team and the engineering team are going to work very closely together. The commissioning team would be managing and executing the particular test on site. It's very likely in all cases that someone from the engineering team is there as well to witness the test, participate in the test, evaluate results in real time, and help make those decisions on what should take place if there's any issues that are encountered. So very good question. <coughs> Next question, for motor solo run with a decoupled motor, mechanical should be present to check for noises and lubrication of the bearings. This is my method. What do you think about it? <coughs> I agree, yep. For anything that could pre uh, potentially present any mechanical issues, uh, that's a fairly short test to do that mechanical run. You're probably going to want the right discipline expert involved to participate in that test. Uh, certainly for vibrations, noises, uh, lubricants. The mechanical uh, experts on your team are definitely the ones that are in best position to help and provide guidance if there's any issues that are encountered there. The electrical team is going to focus on their electrical activities and to make sure that nothing's missed, it's a good thing to have uh, your mechanical individual there as well because he's going to potentially notice something that the electrical team members may not. So absolutely, dependent on the test that's being involved, you want to call in the right experts and make sure they're there, willing and able to participate and can provide their expertise to help diagnose or identify any issues with the equipment. It's always better to identify issues at that point in time than three months later when that pump is being used or motor is being used for uh, actual plant processes. If we're hearing not noises or there's no lubricant in the bearings, well... <laughs> That's a bad thing to discover while we're trying to start up the plant. We want to <clears throat> catch those earlier. And by having your mechanical team members there, they're going to help to identify those earlier issues. <coughs> Next question. How do you prioritize when different activities go at the same time? SIMOP. Yep. Very good question. And uh, the commissioning team... Uh, is definitely a, a key contributor to this process to help identify that, particularly in a brownfield project where there's in-service assets and we're trying to bring new, new assets into the system. So that's uh, <clears throat> a perfect example of simultaneous operations. The in-service assets will always take priority because we can't be uh, inadvertently disrupting in-service equipment. In-service equipment must be maintain so that we can maintain the performance of the current in-plant processes. But there may be situations where in order to complete a particular commissioning activity, we do need to take an outage or a shutdown. And in that case, those need to be planned very closely to determine that this system, this in-service existing uh, brownfield uh, piece of equipment needs to be taken out of service for three days so that we can tie in our new uh, electrical or mechanical uh, plant process system. So in that case where there's simultaneous operations taking place, we need to plan those pretty closely to plan that shutdown, make sure it happens on the days that are planned, make sure that we don't extend past the end of the outage because that may not be a possibility. 
we must be returning the equipment back to service on the dates that are promised to the point where you maybe even want to have an extra day of contingency because it's always better to return a system back to service earlier than to be at the end of your outage and try and beg and plead for uh, an outage extension because you may not be able to get it and the outage may not end. I can think of an example where we had to take an outage on a large uh, international uh, 500 kV transmission line. And the only time to take that outage was in a shoulder season between the heating and cooling seasons. The only date we could get for that outage was uh, a particular three, three days in May. And this was planned months in advance, almost a year in advance to determine when that outage was going to take place. And those were the dates. We couldn't determine the day before that we needed to delay that outage. That means, okay, you wait a year. Next May, let's try again. So some of those definitely have to be prioritized from that perspective. And then to make sure that the work is complete within that three-day outage. For some of the smaller activities um, where there's maybe multiple systems being started up at the same time, the commissioning team needs to be planning that and essentially determining the startup sequence of the plant so that this system is going to be started up first, then next week this system is going to be started up second. If, if commissioning is disorganized and commissioning is requesting to start up two systems on the same day, well, then I, say, I would say that's the commissioning team's fault for not planning that out appropriately. Um, from a commissioning team perspective, we would never propose that. But when there's other in-service assets in the plant, we need to be planning and managing our activities, knowing what else is going on in the plant so that um, all simultane simultaneous operations are taking place without disruption. That's the, uh, this is a good question. This is the, the best part of commissioning is planning out the complexity of how this is all going to fit together and is one of the main reasons to have commissioning team involved earlier in the project because this requires some thought. If you have the commissioning team showing up a few days or a few weeks or even just a, a couple months before some of these activities are going to take place, well, then you're not going to have an opportunity to plan these simultaneous operations. Things are going to go wrong. Things are going to be disorganized and uncoordinated. And take that to your project manager and help uh, them understand, explain to them, why the commissioning team needs to be involved earlier, the complexities of planning simultaneous operations and the, the thought process that needs to take place earlier in the project so that we can avoid uh, these disruptions in the plan by uh, finding out that potentially some things can't happen at the same time due to SIMOP. So very good question, I like it. <clears throat> Next question, how do we categorize and or the starting point needed in commissioning a data center specifically for the communications and electrical system? Very specific question. So again, you're going to look at the technical dependencies of what system is required first prior to the next system. So some of your auxiliary systems, your, your fiber optic communication systems, communication systems, any protection systems, electrical systems, building systems, balance of plant systems, just the, the lighting within the data center, those you're going to need uh, first based on what some of the next activities are going to take. So of course you're not going to be able to test your uh, your data servers, your, uh, your cubicle racks, if you haven't got your fiber up and running. You're not going to be able to test your remote communications if you've got your, if your fiber system is still missing. So when we categorize or, or prioritize some of those systems, we know that in order to do the full server rack communication, we need our fiber systems uh, interconnected between our uh, server racks. We need our fiber ring going off site so that we can control and communicate with other systems. So it's strictly going to depend. Um, a data center would be no different than any other um, industrial plant process where we need to identify from a technical standpoint what systems we do we need first in order to fully commission the next system and the system after that and the system after that. So in the case of a, a data center uh, all of those building systems are going to be needed, life safety systems to get an occupancy for, for the building. Then the building actually doing something useful as in all the 
the data communication racks and uh, data servers within the building, that would come kind of post building completion or post occupancy permit. So I hope that helps a little bit. I know that it's a bit more complicated than that when you get into the details and specifics of the design of your data center. But once you get into those specific details, you'll see from a technical standpoint what's required prior to the next system in order to be able to fully commission it. Next question, what is the best pre-commissioning systematization philosophy equipment wise or to follow energization sequence upstream CB and cable and transformer and downstream CB what is your experience so the philosophy um, I follow is to always start at the the various various uh, high level of the project so look at the highest level single level diagram that you can find of the plants or the highest level P and ID system of the of the project and you're going to want to start there so at the the big block chunk of the project you know that you need um, I'll use this example again you know that you need the 230 kV AC switch yard before you can fully commission any any of the HVDC components of the project starting at that big block high level picture of the four or five or six main components of the project is going to give you your first outline of what needs to be commissioned first, what needs to be commissioned second, what needs to be commissioned third. Then that's going to allow you to then dive into deeper of the particular components that make up one of those big block systems. So if you dive into a bit deeper on your 230 kV AC switchyard system, you're going to see the various equipment and functions that make up that system. You're going to get down to maybe one of the AC bays, one of the uh, ring bus connected uh, breakers that form that uh, 230 kV ring bus. And then you can even drive down into deeper to get to right to the equipment level where you identify that particular breaker number three. That's the philosophy I use to determine when that specific piece of equipment needs to be tested because that's going to allow you see to see how it fits up into the bigger level, higher level uh, process of the plant. If you start the other way around, if you start right at an equipment level, um, of course that's the first thing you're going to test uh, during pre-commissioning is the 230 kV breaker, but you don't necessarily have that picture of how it fits up into the overall hierarchy of the plant. So by starting at the big block picture and then drilling down into the details, that's going to help you see where that breaker fits into the overall big picture plan and therefore where that particular piece of equipment needs to be tested in the sequence. So that's that's the philosophy I use. It seems to work well to at least get to that high level big picture of how this all fits together. And uh, it's not a it's not a quick process. What I described there could potentially take a year to map out a project of that size um, to get down to that very specific equipment level and the sequence that needs to take place. But through that year long process, you're going to be able to fit all the pieces of the puzzle together into this big picture and how you're going to go through your commissioning and start up sequence to build up the end product of the plant. Next question, lots of good questions. During an emergency generator endurance test of 72 hours, should the load be 100% or the minimum load required to run the engines like 40 or 50%? That's going to depend on your contract maybe and the requirements for that endurance test. Your contract may require uh, the various loads to be applied um, over that 72 hour run. Uh, you're certainly going to want to follow whatever your contract says in how that uh, endurance test is going to be run. Now that's not all, always the case. The contract may be silent on that and say do an endurance run test. So then if that's the case, you're going to look at the, the risk involved uh, and uh, the potential damage that it could occur. If, if this is a large emergency generator and large currents are being applied and this is the first time that it's being run, I would suggest you probably step that in various levels. If that's one level or two level, um, at the various current loading before you get to under 100% uh, loading. Maybe that's not the full 72 hours. Maybe you're going you're gonna to step it up in series where you're, the first hour you're going to run it at 25%, the second hour you're going to run it at 
uh, 50% or maybe run it at, at three hours. But um, based on your risk tolerance and uh, risk of damaging equipment, that's going to help you gauge um, how fast you want to push that or how quickly you want to get to 100% uh, load. And if, if this particular emergency generator has a six-month lead time, then I'd be fairly cautious. I'd maybe run that at a lower current load limit for a few hours before stepping it up to 100% uh, load. This is something uh, we would have done in the past where we're loading the uh, various equipment in our HVDC system that we've commissioned in the past where the, there was three heat runs that were defined at various load limits. You'd run the, the heat run for a few hours at 25%, 75%, and then 100%. So I, I think it's a good idea to step through the various load limits until you can uh, mitigate that risk and gain confidence that the equipment's not going to be damaged once you get to 100% load. Uh, and for, for a few more hours of testing, it's good risk mitigation to, to step that up and gain that confidence before getting to, to full load. If, if that particular equipment's damaged and uh, six months to replace it, well, then it was probably worth taking a few extra hours to confirm that that's not going to be the case because, yeah, that can be disastrous if we don't have that piece of equipment for six months and have to try and replan the project to start up the plant without or in other some, some sort of configuration without that piece of equipment. And despite our best efforts, there's, there's always infant mortality. If, if we get to that 72-hour runtime, at full load and on the 70th hour there's a major equipment failure at least by stepping it through our various loads we did our best to mitigate that uh, risk but there's always infant mortality that is hard to hard to plan around it's like it's an unknown unknown um, but we want to mitigate the the chance of that happening by potentially seeing any issues at lower load levels before uh, on the 70th hour, potentially having that infant mortality issue and having a major equipment failure. Next question, and maybe the last question, we'll wrap it up here and conclude today's session. At turnover stage, what are the requirements for the system dossier? Aha, very good question, and maybe everybody's least favorite part of the project. At the end of the project, everybody wants to congratulate and move on to the next project to do some more exciting commissioning, but there's always a closeout period where we have to gather documentation, put it in a, a manageable fashion and hand it over to the owner so that they can use this information for operation of the plant for decades to come. Often this has been a, a very daunting task, if not managed well during uh, construction and commissioning, it can be a quite quite a mess to gather up all the documentation and put the, put it in a nice package to hand over to the owner. There's there's far superior systems that exist to help manage this and if used properly can significantly reduce the level of effort required at the end of commissioning for turnover where all of our O&M manuals, red line drawings, um, test results, uh, operating procedures, switching procedures, those would be the bulk of what would exist within that turnover package to the owner. Essentially, anything that they would use for operation on a day-to-day -day basis would go in that turnover package. They're not necessarily going to need things like the historical project information, such as RFIs and change notices and project letters, those types of things. They're not going to reference those on a day-to-day -day basis. That sort of history may be captured somewhere uh, in the project archives, but not necessarily used by the operators on a day-to-day -day basis. They're going to need more things like the O&M manuals uh, to define how to operate the equipment, how to maintain it, the maintenance intervals that are required, uh, the drawing packages for troubleshooting, any issues encountered on site. Those types of things are going to go into the turnover binders, mm, turnover binders being the historical term, but out of our commissioning management software systems to hand over to the owner that they can use ongoing for the life of the plant. The, the, t the turnover information is really, um, we want to get away from the, the hard copies, the printed binders, and I should stop using that term. 
is because all of our files are going to be electronic, uh, electronically searchable so that we can navigate through the immense amount of information or operations can navigate through it to find the information that they need. Um, so that's really the process at the end of the project. And if you can leverage a CMS, that will significantly make it easier for you uh, to go through this turnover package process at the end of the project rather than spending months and months trying to gather up all this information, hiring some poor summer student to wade through all this information and make sense of it all while everybody's trying to get out of there and skip on into their, their next project. So that would be my recommendation there. So really great questions. I loved all these questions. They were fantastic. It's great to see everybody's engagement and super interest in pre-commissioning and commissioning. Um, I'm glad to see it and I'm happy that you're here to be part of this commissioning community. We'll continue these discussions um, and, and live webinar series. So definitely join us for our next live webinar. We haven't picked a date and we haven't picked a topic. So if you've got any ideas for topics, definitely send them in the comments or send us an email and let us know. We're always looking for great ideas on what the commissioning community is looking for and how we can help provide you the information that you need to be able to commission our complex projects. So glad to have you here. Thanks for all your questions. Um, I trust you found this information helpful. Definitely hope to see you in our commissioning workshop. So check that out at commissioningworkshop.com. And thanks everyone for your great participation. Have a great day.